um, as to how God might answer our prayers. Uh, I think part of the reason, again, that God doesn't uh, answer our prayers that way is so that we would, again, see, see Him as the one who, who came through and answered those prayers. Well, we're in the midst of a sermon series uh, here this, this week. Uh, this is week three of a sermon series. I'm just calling Who? And we're looking at um, Bible characters who are more, uh, what would you say, they're, they're less known Bible characters. They're not insignificant. I, I'm trying to avoid that word. But they're less known to us. And um, the, the guy we're going to look at today almost let his preconceived notions of how God was going to work uh, derail God's work altogether. Uh, today we're going to look uh, at uh, someone who's a, a part of a story uh, within the life of Elijah, not a, a minor, not a, a unheard of Bible character. Elijah's a, a major character, but uh, our guy just shows up in one one little chapter, one little story with uh, Elijah, and his name is probably not on the on the tip of your tongue. His name is Naaman. Naaman. Uh, not a lot of our kids are going to be named Naaman, but uh, he's, a, he's a character we're going to look at today. First, I want to just kind of tell you the story of Naaman. Uh, and then we're going to take a look at the, the scripture that talks about Naaman in uh, 2 Kings chapter 5, if you want to follow along in, in the Bible. Uh, and then I think there are some interesting truths and applications and insights that we can learn from this, uh, this man and from his story. Uh, everyone of us ought to leave here today with either a reminder of how God works, uh, a warning of uh, how sometimes we can kind of gum up God's plan by our preconceived notions, or maybe some encouraging words about uh, the Lord's hand in our lives at different times. So here's the story. The story begins by telling us that Naaman is a general in the army of uh, Syria. He's a general in the Syrian army, but he has leprosy. Bummer. Leprosy is a terrible disease. We don't deal with it very often, but it's a disease that affects nerves. And because it causes uh, the nerves to stop functioning, you don't feel when you have placed your hand on a hot fire or you've got it caught on some barbed wire or whatever and you can begin to sort of tear up your body um, and it can eventually lead to death if, uh, if left untreated. So uh, this name, Naaman has leprosy. He's a general of the Syrian army. Um, he also has a wife who has a slave girl who uh, you know, is there working for them. And uh, the slave girl tells his wife, oh, if, if Naaman would just go see Elijah, Elijah could cure him of his leprosy. So Naaman talks to the, his king. He gets the necessary papers that he needs to travel uh, from his country into Israel and go see Elijah. Um, when he gets there, the king of Israel thinks, oh, no. This guy is coming here to pick a fight with me. And he doesn't know what to do, but Elijah just kind of steps in and says, I'll take care of it. Uh, when he finally gets uh, a chance to, to bring his case to Elijah, Elijah doesn't even come out of his house to address and help this guy, which, which Naaman takes as an insult. And uh, uh, Elijah says, go down to the Jordan River, dip in it seven times, be healed. And Naaman says, I'm not doing that. That's not how this is supposed to work. He's supposed to come out and do a big ceremony and wave his hands over me, call God's you know, power down. This is ridiculous. And he starts to leave. But luckily, he has a slave in his life who says, hey, you know, uh, sir, if uh, Elijah had asked you to do something, you know, really difficult, you would have done it. But he's asking you to do something simple. Why don't, why don't you give it a try? So he listens and goes and does that, dips himself seven times, and he's healed. Comes back to Elijah to thank him, 
and to praise the Lord and say, you know, there's no other God than the God in Israel. Interesting story. So let's take a look at uh, what the Bible has to say and see uh, what maybe the Lord has to say to us through His Word. So but first let's pause and pray. Lord, I pray that you would speak to us today <clears throat> through your word, through this story of Naaman. Spirit, I pray that you would cause each person here to have a moment today where they sense that you're speaking directly to them. Lord, I pray that it might be a word of encouragement or a word of conviction, uh, might be an insight into a specific <clears throat> situation that you know about. Or maybe just a general sense that your word is correcting our thinking or helping helping us follow you more, more closely. Lord, I pray that you would speak to us today. Amen. Amen. So we're going to put the scripture up on the screen. It's in 2 Kings 5. And it says, Now Naaman was a commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. Now bands of raiders from Aram had gone out and taken captive a young girl from Israel, and she served Nathan, Naaman's wife. And she said to her mistress, If only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria, he could cure him of leprosy. You know, as I read that, it, it kind of reminded me of last week's sermon. Uh, if, if you weren't here, we talked about how uh, when we trust God, and sometimes we need to trust God to the point of saying, Lord, I don't understand what's going on, but I trust you. You must have some plan in place that I'm not aware of, but I'm going to trust you. And when we trust him like that, we find peace. Now here's a girl who's taken captive, uh, living in a foreign country as a slave, and, and yet she seems to have that attitude that we talked about last week. You know, maybe God has a purpose that I don't know about, uh, I, that I'm you've been take, taken captive and I'm a, I'm a slave. She's not griping, she's not thinking, my master has leprosy? Great! I hope he dies a horrible death. No, she's not doing that. Could we do as well? Could we have as little guile as this little servant girl has? Um, wow, I mean, right there is a powerful lesson for Naaman if he will just notice this. Um, she's living, she's a living lesson that sometimes God has a plan uh, in our lives that we're not aware of. Uh, and we need to continue to follow him. We need to trust and obey uh, as, we, as we walk with him. Well, we pick up the story again in verse 4. It says, Naaman went to his master, kind of going to his king, and told him what the girl from Israel had said. By all means, the king of Aram replied, I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten sets of clothing. The letter that he took to the king of Israel read, quote, With this letter I am sending my servant Naaman to you, so that you may cure him of leprosy. Not quite accurate communication there. Not really going to the king of Israel. He was going to Elijah to cure him. So there's a little miscommunication that's going to come in here. Uh, verse 7, as soon as the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his robes, which is a, an Old Testament, Middle Eastern way of showing distress. Uh, he tore his robes and said, am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of his leprosy? See how he's trying to pick a quarrel with me? Here, here's a, a perfect example of preconceived notions. You know, first we have um, Naaman's uh, preconceived notion that, uh, you know, I'm going to have to pay to get this done. So I'm going to bring all this, all this silver and gold. 
And then, wow, who do they have as king in Israel? This guy sounds like a huge chicken. You know, why is he coming? What am I going to do? Well, I can't bring people back to life. You know, he just sounds like a liberty gibber, my mom would call it. But luckily, enter Elijah. When Elijah, picking up in verse 8, when Elijah, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent him this message. Why have you torn your robes? Have the man come to me, and he will know there's a prophet in Israel. Uh, there's, there's that piece that we talked about last week. Hey, God's in control. Just, it's going to be okay. Send this guy my way. Lord will work things out. He'll work out the details. How can Elijah be so confident, cool, and collected? Well, because he knows God. And he trusts God. The king is looking to himself. Notice all the, the first person pronouns there. Am I God? Can I restore life? Why is he picking a fight with me? He's, he's thinking about himself. I can't do this. What? What? I? What? Why, why me? Where Elijah is thinking about God, what God's going to do. So Naaman went, picking up in verse 9, so Naaman went with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elijah's house. Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger, interesting, to say to him, Go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will be restored, and you will be clean. Cleansed. Seems pretty straightforward. You know, it's like a drive-by healing, right? <laughs> guy just pulls up outside, gets his instructions, go dip yourself seven times. Uh, the reason, by the way, that Elijah didn't come out, to the, out of his house and, and greet this man and and go near him is because according to Jewish law, uh, that would make him unclean. So he sent a message uh, to this guy, here's what you need to do. I know what, you're, I know what you need. God knows what you need. Here's how we're going to get that done. Pick it up in verse 11. But Naaman, our guy, went away angry and said, I thought he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord as God, and wave his hand over the spot, and cure me of my leprosy. Are not a banana, I don't know how you pronounce that, are not Abaddon and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters in Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and went away in a rage. In a rage, stopped off. I'm not doing that. I got better waters back home. That's not how it's supposed to happen. And there are traditions in that time period, and even today, there are beliefs that if, if a shaman type person will, will wave their hands over somebody, that that will heal them. Um, and their wounds will be healed. Uh, but again, he's got these preconceived notions. This is how I thought surely he would do, do it this way. He's not doing it the right way. So I'm leaving. How do we do this? Do we ever do this? Do we ever do this? We get in our heads, for example, that the Lord wants a friend of ours to, to come to know him. You know, we really want this person to come into a saving relationship with the Lord. And, you know, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share my faith with him. But here's how it's going to work. You know, I'm going to say this, they're going to say that, it's going to work out this way. I have a friend, a good friend, who, a um, good committed Christian, but he believes that if he's going to share his faith with someone, first he has to convince them that um, God created the world in seven days. Not even going to bring up Jesus till this guy acknowledges this, that God created the world in seven days. Because if he doesn't believe that, he's not going to believe Jesus. Well, you know, God doesn't always work the same way in every person. And I'm here to tell you, there are a lot of people who come to believe in Jesus before they believe that God created the world in seven days. 
but he's got a preconceived notion. This is how it's going to work. Uh, I witnessed a couple a while back, this is a few years ago, who really needed marriage counseling. Uh, she constantly belittled and put down her husband. And for years this went on, and we could kind of see this has got to be a difficult marriage to, to live in. But he had decided, both Christian people, he had decided, I'm just going to forgive her. I'm going to forgive her, and I'm going to love her. And I'm just, when she's insulting and, and demeaning to me every day, I'm just going to love her back. I'm going to love her, and someday my love is going to break through, and she's going to realize, oh, honey, I've been strong all these years. And our marriage is going to be saved, right? Well, didn't work out that way. That went on for 20 years. And finally he had had enough and he just said, that's it. I want a divorce. And when he said that, it kind of shocked her. And it woke her up and she, uh, wait, uh, wow, you know, you're right. I've been wrong. And she repented of her ways. She made amends. She... Uh, said she'd be interested in, in uh, not only going to see counseling, but be involved in discipleship, and began to really make some, some real changes in her life. And I, I said to the, to the man, hey, you know, why aren't you thrilled? All the things you've been hoping for all these years are, are happening. No, nope. he said, that's not the way it was supposed to happen. It wasn't supposed to happen because I threatened a, a divorce. It was supposed to happen because I showed her so much love. My love was supposed to break her. But she's not going to, if that's not the way it's going to work, I'm out. And they ended up getting divorced. We pray something crazy. Like, Lord, we put our hands into your, we put our, our lives into your hands. Or even crazier, Lord, make us like Jesus. Help us be thankful for the things we have. And guess what? God takes us seriously. He allows a business to fail, our church to be uh, dramatically changed, uh, health issues to arise, a good friend betrays us, our children drop out of school or do something we don't want them to do, and we say, God, what is this? I just gave my life. I want to be more like Christ, and this is what you bring. And God says, oh, I thought you wanted to be like Jesus. I do, but what's this? Oh, this is the curriculum. This is, this is how that's going to happen. You think it's just going to happen because I just shower you with blessings? You're going to become like Christ? It, you know, it, it may bother us. We may bristle uh, at the idea that God would use disagreeable and sometimes even wrongful acts of others to teach us a lesson. But I would encourage you, if that's the case, to read your Bible. Uh, you'll be amazed at how many times God uses the sinful uh, acts of other people to correct his children. Uh, the children of Israel were made slaves, bitten by snakes, swallowed up by the earth, killed in battle, on and on and on, so that they would return to him, so that they would, would grow closer to him over and over and learn that lesson over and over again. God doesn't always work the way that we think he should. And, you know, if you have some irritant in your life, I won't ask for a show of hands, but I bet we would all raise our hands. We have some irritant in our lives. It's a pretty good bet. Uh, I guess I would go so far as to say I can pretty much 100% guarantee that God wants to use that irritant in your life to make you more like Jesus. That's just the curriculum. That's the way he does it. Well, let's pick up our story in, uh, in verse 13 here. It says, Naaman's servants went to him and said, remember he had left in a huff. He was, he was very angry that Elijah didn't do it the way he thought it should be done. So in verse 13, Naaman's servants went to him and said, my father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, you would have done it. How much more then, when he tells you, wash and be cleansed? So, to Naaman's credit, got to give him credit, he listened to a, a servant. He went down and dipped himself 
in the Jordan seven times as the man of God had told them, and his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. Wow, miracle. Isn't it refreshing to have outside voices of wisdom in our lives sometimes? Thank God for wise counselors in our lives. Here's one of Nathan, uh, Naaman's servants who brings some much needed common sense uh, to, to Naaman's thinking. Without the, this voice of reason, Naaman would have completely missed out on the miracle that God wanted to, to work in his life. Um, you know, there's a little story told, maybe you've heard it, it's kind of a standard pastor story, about uh, how there's a room in heaven, you know, that's like the size of an airplane hangar, and it's just filled with boxes. And the sign on the door says, uh, blessings God wanted to give, but no one asked. Right? And the lesson is, you have not because you ask not. Well, I wonder if maybe there's another room that's filled with, with boxes that says uh, blessings missed out because of preconceived notions. You know, this is how God's supposed to do it. And if he doesn't do it that way, we, we just miss it. You know, a, lot, a, a little common sense can go a long way in our lives. These are some things I've, I've actually heard over the years. Uh, I've heard people say, uh, you know, the church is always asking for money. You know, anybody ever heard that one before? You know, a little common sense added into that picture as well. You know, every, every uh, organization does need money to, to run and operate. Yeah, and, you know, is that all they want? Are they always asking? No. But, yeah, yeah, churches need money. That's, everybody you know, understands that. Um, I've heard people say, oh, I, I, I wish someone would come and visit me. Great, nothing wrong with that. A uh, little common sense. Have you called anyone and asked them to come visit you? Oh, forgot about that. You know, somehow people are supposed to read your mind, I guess. You know, just a little common sense. Uh, I, I've been guilty of this one. You know, I need this, I want this, I desire this, I'm hoping for X, Y, Z, whatever. Well, have you even prayed about it? Oh, sorry. You should probably pray about that. That would be a good thing. Uh, sometimes we just make things too complicated. You know, uh, all churches want to grow, right? And so there's all kinds of growth uh, information out there and seminars and ideas of how to grow a church. And they're all, you know, there's, I'm not saying we shouldn't learn and grow. Uh, you know, understand those things and apply some of them. But oftentimes, the common sense is to say, yeah, but just remember, people come to church because they're invited. Oh, oh yeah. You know, maybe we don't need some big, you know, uh, program. We just need to invite some folks. That would be great. Well, let's uh, continue our story, kind of wrap it up here in verse 15. Uh, our guy, then Naaman, and all his attendants, took his, his slave people with him, went back to the man of God. He stood before him and said, Now I know there is no God in all the world except in Israel. So please accept a gift from your servant. And the prophet answered, As surely as the Lord lives, whom I serve, I will not accept a thing. And even though Naaman ur urged him, he refused. So Naaman, you know, wanted to, to, to pay him or give him a gift, and Elijah said, no, 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 I'm not accepting any gifts. Now, in the past, at other times uh, in his ministry, Elijah did accept gifts. So it's not that he's against gifts. Uh, in this case, he really wanted Naaman to understand this had nothing to do with you. You did not pull this off. You did not bribe God. You, you know, you can't put this on. You know, God knew I was going to pay him, and so he, you know, he brought, he did this miracle first, but yeah, I eventually paid. No, this is all about God. 
God showed his mercy to you, and I want you to get that picture loud and clear. That's what Elijah is, is hoping. Some commentaries I looked at really drew a parallel between this story and the story we all find ourselves in, in, in of the salvation story. That, you know, sometimes we have a preconceived notion of how God is going to uh, work in terms of our being allowed into heaven. And we all have this sickness. We don't have uh, leprosy, but we have sin. And that, um, you know, God works in mysterious ways, like we said. And God will heal that, but he will not be bribed. He will not be bought. This is a gift, just like this gift that God does in Naaman's life. God offers a gift to us. And he'll heal uh, our, our sickness of sin if we'll just... Just do it his way, which is accept Jesus. The Bible says um, that if you believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved. You will be healed. Well, you know, I'm sure in a group like this, there's probably a lot of things that we, we would desire a, a healing in our lives. Could be things like alcohol addiction or marriage issues, uh, depression, uh, anger issues. Uh, fractured relationships, um, self-hate. Uh, maybe we need to be healed in the area of uh, dealing with pornography or lust, uh, no motivation, gossip, on and on. We could list things that uh, we all um, struggle with and would love to see some healing in our lives um, at different times. So let me encourage you to take uh, four tips from Naaman's story and apply them to your life. First of all, don't let preconceived notions get in the way. God works in mysterious ways. Let him, let him provide in his way. Second of all, listen to common sense from those wise outside voices in your life. Um, like Naaman did with his slaves. And, and don't rule out people who are not in your circle. You know, these are, these are people who are below Naaman, but he had the um, foresight to listen. Thirdly, realize it may be a simple fix instead of some heroic uh, deed on your part. God may be wanting to heal you in a way that's very simple, uh, rather than some elaborate idea that we have in our minds. And then lastly, I just want to encourage you to trust and obey. That's really how we um, overcome these preconceived notions is to, to trust God like we talked about last week. To say, Lord, I know you, you're in control. I know you love me. You've got a plan. I may not be aware of what you're doing right now, but I know you and I trust you. And obey. Do what, do what he's asking you to do. He's saying, dip seven times in the river. May not be the way I pictured it was going to happen, but the Lord works in mysterious ways. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this story of this Bible character that we often don't take a look at, but uh, who I think has some, some great lessons. <coughs> great lessons for our lives, Lord. Pray that we would... Um, come away from here today, maybe with a little bit of conviction, maybe with a little encouragement, uh, maybe a new insight as to how you might be at work in our lives. I know you want to be at work. I know you're constantly on the move. Uh, and Lord, I just pray that we would um, take a tip from Naaman and allow you to work the way you want to work in our lives. And we ask all these things in your name. Amen.